Okay, I think we're live, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Environmental Tracks Buck Creek Project and Historic Bridges Laws and Policies session. I'm Mike McGregor from uh, Bacon Farmer Workman Engineering and Testing, and I want to thank you for joining. As we get started, I'd like to introduce the pre presenters for this session, who are Michael Leathers and Tom Springer. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, gentlemen. All right, thanks, Mike. Um, I'll be presenting first, and I'm going to share my screen. All right, uh, you all should be seeing my screen here. Uh, I'm gonna be presenting on the Buck Creek Project. Uh, the official name for this is the Kentucky 80, Kentucky 461 Interchange. Uh, it's located in Pulaski County, District 8, near the city of Shopville. Uh, H&B was the uh, primary consultant to do the Phase 1 and Phase 2 design, and uh, we also were in charge of the environmental process. Um, we followed it through from the NEPA document through the permitting process, and uh, we had CRA on our team to handle the cultural resources. Uh, just to give a little bit of history on the project, uh, Kentucky 80 and Kentucky 461, they, they're both rural arterial high roads on the national highway system. Uh, they're vital connection, providing access from I-75 uh, to the city of Somerset, Cumberland Parkway, and the recreational area of Lake Cumberland. Uh, 461 is the north-south movement here. Uh, it ties to I-75 up in Mount Vernon, uh, and then ends at Kentucky 80. Uh, Kentucky 80 is the east-west movement uh, going from London to Somerset. So the idea for a project uh, originally began with the I-66 corridor study that looked at uh, connecting London and, some, uh, and Somerset. Uh, this was back in the early 2000s. They had a DEIS uh, in 2006. Uh, part of that project was a Kentucky 80 461 interchange, uh, but the FEIS was never completed for the project and obviously uh, it was not constructed. Another project that is related to this is the Somerset Northern Bypass Project, where they had a, a EA Fonzie was approved in 2004. Uh, the EA Fonzie did not reference Kentucky 80 461 intersection, uh, but it did reference the I-66 corridor study uh, and with the plan that the bypass would be converted to I-66 if ever constructed. Uh, another aspect to this project is, is that the right-of-way was purchased for the Northern Bypass. So, so it has not been constructed yet, but they do own that right of way. Um, all that kind of brings up to the project we have today. Uh, Kentucky 80461 interchange is how this project began in early 2018 as a, as a scoping study, looking at that intersection, uh, looking at potential options to converting that grade intersection to a grade separated interchange. The traffic analysis found that the intersection was operating at a LOS F, F level service. Uh, there were 74 accidents within that five year study period. So it was a high accident rate. And uh, just uh, the knowledge that the vehicles were having a hard time making a left turn movement. As you can see, Kentucky 80 is four lanes of traffic. Uh, it has the offset left turn movement there. So trucks, especially uh, semis going to industrial areas and you know trucks carrying boats going to Lake Cumberland. I uh, had a real tough time with this left turn movement. Uh, at the time for this Kentucky 80 461 interchange, uh, the proposed project we configured had an initial and ultimate configuration. Uh, the initial would just handle the movements that are out there right now, and the ultimate configuration would allow for the tie-in to that northern bypass project that I mentioned. 
so that's how it all started. Um, late spring of that 2018, uh, two big changes occurred. One was to the design of the project. Uh, two changes for the design um, were implemented. One uh, was just north of that intersection to the Valley Oak Industrial Complex. This area generates about 2,900 jobs for the area. Uh, it has a lot of semi-trailers obviously coming in and out through all periods of the day. Um, it has an at-grade intersection, of course, so we're looking at another grade-separated interchange. Traffic analysis showed a, a level service F. Uh, there were 16 accidents at the time, but uh, which isn't as many as the other interchange, but it was uh, well known that the, the same problem occurred. Trucks were having a hard time finding ways to make that left turn on the 461. Uh, KYTC was aware of this. Uh, they had some projects back in 2012 to add left and right turn lanes, but but the safety issue uh, remained. It, it didn't actually solve that, the problem they had there. So uh, another thing to point out was that the businesses in this area, uh, in this complex, were very supportive of the project and, and they were included throughout the design process. So the other design change that occurred uh, was the widening of 461. It's the way to tie these interchanges together. Uh, the project was proposed to widen about four and a half miles of 461 uh, from a two lane to a four lane. Uh, the widening would begin at Kentucky 80 down at the intersection that we previously discussed and would go up to Buck Creek. Now, as everyone is probably pretty well aware, Buck Creek, uh, it's a pretty significant stream. It's designated as outstanding resource water. It's a re uh, reference reach stream and it's an exceptional water. And then on top of that is also has critical habitat for three listed mussel species, uh, two that are federally listed, one that's state listed. So that was obviously something the team was aware of uh, whenever we started discussing the widening of 461. Uh, so obviously we did not want to impact the stream if we could uh, we could prevent that. We, we did not want to impact it. So we looked at the bridge. Uh, it had a sufficiency rating of 85.6. Uh, status of not deficient. So we felt like we could stop prior to that. And, and it also has a couple miles uh, from the industrial park uh, that allowed the trucks to integrate into the flow of traffic. Uh, they could gain speed, get integrated. Uh, so we felt like there was a, a good stopping point for the project. And then just to go through the purpose and the need of this project that we came up with, and the purpose is based off the growth uh, from the industrialized development that's occurred along 461 and along with the tourism at Lake Cumberland. Uh, so that growth has re uh, resulted in increased traffic, particularly the truck traffic, like I mentioned, and, and it's causing mobility and safety issues. So the purpose of the project was to enhance regional mobility, improve the safety, reduce congestion within the roadway network that connects I-75 Cumberland Parkway Hal Rogers Parkway in the Lake Cumberland Recreational Area. So the other big change that occurred in the spring of 2018 was that the project became a candidate for the bill grant. Uh, so once that occurred, uh, part of the grant application is to show that you can meet uh, the timeline that was required. So to meet that timeline, we had to plan for a mid 2020 construction letting. Uh, that doesn't give a lot of time for design and environmental and, and right-of-way phases. So, so the, the schedule that they came up with was to begin preliminary engineering and environmental in July of 2018 and have the environmental NEPA document completed in July of 2019. So we had a year to do the environmental document. But as you see there, something that happened a little bit out of the norm is the right-of-way phase got pushed up. Uh, to have you know, at least a year, a little bit longer than a year to, to purchase the right of way to get the utilities relocated. So we had to move that phase up. So that all started in early 2019. And some of that early work was ongoing during the same time as the NEPA process was, was finishing up. And uh, they got the good news later on that year in 2018 that the project did receive the bill grant. So uh, they will be receiving $25 million there for this project. So we went and developed the several alternatives. Um, the alternatives mainly focused around the interchanges, uh, providing a couple different options uh, to look at. And what they 
uh, the district and the project team uh, went with was a cloverleaf design at the Kentucky 80 461 intersection. Uh, two ramps would be built in the initial configuration. Those are what you see in red. And then two ramps, these black the lines here, they would be in the ultimate configuration that would provide the tie in to the northern bypass. Uh, one thing that is significant with this design is that you see as the through movement changes, it's no longer Kentucky 80 and it becomes the Kentucky 461. Uh, so that was a big change with that interchange design. And then for the Valley Oak Industrial Complex, uh, for the preferred alignment on this one, we chose as a photo diamond interchange. And as you can see, there's you know not a lot of room to the north. Uh, you have the industrial facility here, the, uh, the factory with the, the road with several access points, limiting what we could do on that side. And over here, there's actually a cemetery uh, right here. So we were limited on the north, which really made this voted diamond interchange uh, a good option for the project. Uh, what it does is it flips those two northern legs to the south, and you get two two-way roads on the south side of the overpass. Now what this does is give right in, right out access to 461. So it takes out those left turn movements that were an issue for the trucks. Then for the widening of Kentucky 461, you know, obviously, like we said, we, we stopped it just prior to Buck Creek. And uh, really the widening was fairly simple as we try to stay along the existing alignment. We didn't do much shifting of the alignment and uh, we just try as, as, as much as possible to stay within the existing roadway. So when it came to the environmental process, we worked through that. There was you know, relocations. There were a couple of historic houses, uh, nothing, nothing out of the ordinary except for one thing, and that was the stream impacts. Um, obviously, we knew that the Buck Creek was at the northern end with the critical habitat. And anything, anytime you have that, you kind of the ears perk up and you got to make sure you take that into consideration. But we also, so we knew that we avoided all direct impacts to Buck Creek, but we also knew we were impacting the watershed. And this watershed, the Buck Creek watershed, has some of the most pristine water in the state. Uh, there's numerous sensitive species of mussels and fish. So this was all something we were aware of ahead of time. But as we went through, we found, you know, there were two perennial streams that we were going to be impacting. Uh, the first one is Big Spring Branch, and you can see it's being impacted here by this ramp construction. Uh, it, it, it's a perennial stream that drains approximately three square miles. Uh, it converges into Flat Lick Creek, and here's a picture of the stream. Uh, we were impacting about 1,380 feet of this stream, so uh, not a small amount. As I said, that converges into Flat Lick Creek, which is the stream here. Uh, it drains 13.8 square miles, and we were impacting 1,600. And you see the impacts here are, are broken up into two sections. We have uh, a pretty long stretch right here, and then a little bit more over here, which there is an existing uh, box culverts. I think it's triple box culverts right there that that we would be extending. So there would be a little bit of impacts here and then the long stretch uh, right there. And there is a picture, you can see it's a, a good looking stream. It's got tree coverage in the area, uh, it's spring fed. The temperatures were, were cooler in the water uh, because it is spring fed and with that tree coverage. So these were all things that we found during our uh, habitat search and evaluation of the project. So, so with those stream impacts, and just the understanding, you know, we brought this to the district and, and they were aware of, aware of it too. And, and we did a lot of early coordination about this. We didn't want uh, these impacts, which, you know, we saw as, you know, because of the length of the impacts and the quality of the stream being in this watershed, we didn't want this to cause a roadblock to our project, whether it be scheduling or, or cost or, you know, any sort of mitigation type requirements. So. So we went and we coordinated with the district, um, or we coordinated with our design team, we coordinated with DEA, and we even talked to U.S. Fish and Wildlife, did a little bit of early coordination with those guys to just, just discuss this, uh, kind of see what we should do, see if this would be any issues. And uh, 
in that coordination, we kind of committed to doing some natural channel design elements. Uh, we were kind of, we had some several constraints that we were going to have to uh, fit it within, but as applicable, we wanted to do some of these L, uh, natural channel design within the project's footprint. Some of the constraints that we really were uh, tied to is Barnesburg Road, you can see here, is just to the north of the project. Uh, the disturb limits were already right up almost to the shoulder of that road, so so we couldn't do a lot to the stream in this area, and that that was a little bit tight. Another was the proposed right of way. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the schedule had gotten pushed and where some of the right of way was already occurring, at least the early evaluation, the, the look at the, well, I don't think they were making offers at the time, but just kind of that early environment uh, right of way phase. So we had to keep that in mind. We didn't want to increase the right of way any more than, than necessary. Uh, another aspect was the floodplain. That's what the shaded areas here. As you can see, it goes quite a bit up into this residential property. Uh, we didn't want to introduce uh, a channel change that, that that increased the impacts of that floodplain. So that was also in consideration. And finally, the project's in a rock cut. You know, we looked at these streams and and even considering their elements, they were in the bedrock. Uh, and much of the project was going to be a rock cut, which kind of limited some of the type of work we could do uh, for the channel change. But so that was another constraint. So what we came up with uh, is this here. This is the channel change for the project. Uh, zoom in, you can see that they we have 100 foot ripple sections followed by 200 foot pool sections. Uh, we put in a four foot low flow channel. Uh, this would help make sure water was flowing throughout the year so that uh, those species, mussels, fish, whatever that is in these streams could still traverse it even during low flow. Uh, obviously, we put some slope protection when above the rock line. And then we planted, we got a proposed tree and shrub planting uh, that we're putting back. You know, just try to replace what we are taking with the project. Uh, picture I showed earlier, you saw it had nice tree covering. Uh, so we're trying to replace as much as we can. Uh, it's important to note, this was not a stream restoration project uh, because of some of those constraints that we were dealing with um, and the fact that this was not mitigation for the stream impacts, like that was gonna be handled separately. So this was not a stream restoration project. This was just things that the district was committed to doing above and beyond uh, just a typical channel change. Um, also, it's worth noting that this ramp here, uh, is part of the initial configuration or the ultimate configuration, excuse me. Uh, it was not to be built now, but coordination with the highway guys, we knew that they had some extra material they need to waste. They needed somewhere to put it. Um, we knew that we didn't want to impact the stream again, five years, 10 years, 20, whatever, uh, however many years down the road, we didn't want to have additional impacts to the stream. So we worked together, kind of came up with a plan. They're going to build this, this ramp, this ultimate configuration ramp now. Uh, obviously, they're not going to pave it, put any of the, the gravel down, but they're going to at least build it, do all the, uh, the earthwork for that ramp. And like I said, this, this was not done as mitigation for the stream impact. Uh, mitigation is being handled separately. I think they are still pursuing a stream restoration project somewhere else outside of this project. Um, but within the Buck Creek watershed. So what we did is we included uh, the obvious plan profile cross sections. Uh, we also included several typical sections uh, in the plan set. Uh, here we have some typical ripple and pool cross sections that we included, and as well as some construction items, just helping the contractor uh, understand what we're looking for with um, with this natural channel design elements. So, you know, this, all this channel change that we have here was really a result of, of great coordination between our environmental and design team, along with the district, along with DEA. Uh, and with that tight schedule that we were operating under due to the bill grant, it was really required. A lot of this upfront knowledge, a lot of upfront coordination and communication uh, it was very important to keep this project moving, uh, it, keep it on schedule, make sure that 
you know, we were meeting all the deadlines that we had uh, to meet that bill grant requirements. And we were able to do that. I mean, we had the CE document was signed on August 12th. Uh, that was you know, just 12 days past that expedited schedule we called for. Uh, we were able to get the BA cleared. It got approved in uh, April 2020. There was a small revision to the concurrence letter in May, but that was just uh, to cover a typo or something that, that in the original concurrence letter. Uh, the 404, 401 permit, you know, we include all that natural channel design elements in the application, uh, discuss the reasoning for it, and and all that went through uh, went through great coordination with the court. So we got those concurrence letters uh, in the 404 permit in May of 2020. Another piece to this that occurred uh, was we had to do additional archaeology. Um, the coordination that we did with uh, the design team. Uh, we were aware pretty early on that they had done some things during phase two design that were that pushed the disturb limits outside of what we cleared in our NEPA document. Uh, one of the items that occurred was geotechnical recommendations had the slopes flatter uh, than what was initially shown. That pushed our disturb limits out, pushed the proposed right away out, and it went beyond the study area for that was covered in the NEPA document. Same thing, uh, similar thing happened with the right of way that was purchased for utility relocations. Uh, coordination with Tom Klaus at QK4, who was in overseeing the, uh, the utility relocation, did the coordination with, with those companies. You know, he and I talked and they had several new places that, that they had to uh, purchase outside of what we cleared. So we knew we had to evaluate these sites and the only real aspect that it impacted was archeology. span so because of that early coordination that we did, uh, we were able to send CRA back out early 2020 and they were able to get their SHPO concurrence in mid-May. So all the environmental documents that we were uh, overseeing uh, were able to meet that, that mid-summer uh, letting date design. They did the same thing. They, they worked very hard, were able to get all the all the design, all the right of way, everything, everything was working smooth to meet that phase two or that uh, letting date for mid 2020. And the COVID pandemic hits, of course, uh, things got pushed back a little bit, but everybody's pretty happy to say that the project is in this month's letting uh, and is scheduled to be completed 2023. So that's kind of a quick rundown. Uh, like I said, I'm only at the beginning of this this session, but if anyone has any questions, uh, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Uh, at KYTC, the, the central office, Ryan Smith is the PM for the project, and then Jamie West, of course, is the, the EC down in District 8 that, that had a lot of involvement. So any questions that you all have, uh, we'll be glad to help. I don't See, uh, doesn't seem like we have any questions, Tom. I will stop sharing my screen and let you take over.